Theory is History by Jairus Banaji. This is chapter five. The fictions of free labor, contract coercion, and so-called unfree labor. 5.1. Premises, the elusive reality of consent. When is a contract voluntary? The answer is probably never. The underlying assumption in the claim that some or most contracts are voluntary is that we can descriptively identify domains of freedom and distinguish them from domains of choicelessness. The conception of contracts as the outcome of a free choice generalizes to all sorts of contracts, including contracts of employment. Through contract, the general theory, classic, classical law of the 19th century sanitized wage labor and the sanguine images of individual autonomy, private volition, free will, and free agency. There was, of course, a long pre-19th century tradition, going back to antiquity, that had seen wage labor, contracts for the hiring of labor, service in an earlier terminology, in terms of the subordination of the employee to the employer. In one formulation of this, what the worker sells is the right to control his labor power. Since labor power is never disembodied, what employers buy when they buy labor power is command over the use of workers' bodies and their persons. In other words, the worker and his labor, not his labor power, are the subject of contract. Liberal legalism, or the pure or general theory of contract that developed in the 19th century, granted the almost limitless subordination of the wage laborer in the anodine fictions of consent. For example, it was possible and consistent for the U.S. courts to maintain that a servitude which was knowingly and willingly entered into cannot be termed involuntary. Here, willingly meant no more than that no person is required to enter into such a contract unless he chooses to do so. The voluntary sale of labor power was not the antithesis of servitude, but its precondition. Contracts were made to be enforced, and it was convenient to assume that enforcement of contracts was all about implementing the free wills of the parties. Marx had no quarrel with this, describing the contract of employment or voluntary sale of labor power as a formality, while undermining the underlying sense that it had anything to do with the ultimate development of human freedom, or with the kinds of transactions equally placed capitalists struck between themselves. The will theory of contract was a construct of the legal formalism of the 19th century and was accepted for precisely what it was. Hence, the perfectly non-ironic assertion in volume one of Capital that the wage laborer is compelled to sell himself as, of his own free will. At another level, however, it is possible to argue that no contract is free because economic coercion is pervasive under capitalism. This is as true for many capitals as it is for the individual worker. This is certainly what Marx had in mind in characterizing wage labor as voluntary in appearance. And presumably, um, also the sense of Sartre's characterization of the contract of employment as a pseudo contract. However, this sense of constraint as the diffused violence of the practico inert the labor market conceived as a collective in Sartre's sense, or the dull compulsion of economic relations, is signaled in Marx less by any obvious desire to contest the language of voluntarism than by repeated references to the free worker as a free worker. Whatever the common law doctrine of duress, Marx and Engels clearly did not see the isolated wage earner as a free agent or the, wa <clears throat> or the wage contract as a free contract. The issue here is not that of plasticity, of legal reasoning, of where one draws the line between free and unfree labor, but of the incoherence of the concept of free labor under capitalism. Coercion is everywhere because the outcomes of bargaining are heavily conditioned by the legal order in effect at any given moment. The line between freedom and coercion is impossible to draw either as a matter of logic or as a matter of policy. Indeed, in every contract, it is an open question 
both whether the more informed party ought to have shared more of his information with his trading partner, that is a question of fraud arises in some sense in every case, and whether the contract would have been made had each party had other physically imaginable, though socially unavailable options available to him, that is a question of duress arises in every case. 5.2. A Marxism of Liberal Mystifications In a monograph published in the late 1970s, a young economist, Sudipto Mundal, made the interesting move of describing the evolution of bondage in Palamau, a district of South Bihar in India, as an instance of what Marx called the formal subsumption of labor into capital. Mundal argued that the bonded labor system was a product of capital's penetration into agriculture, and was evolved by landowners in response to a massive exodus of labor and a bid to hold wages down. Over a decade passed without any substantial theoretical discussion of these issues, till V. K. Ramakandran published Wage Labor and Unfreedom in Agriculture in 1990. Ramakandran displayed considerable condescension towards Mundell, to view the most backward forms of bonded labor as capitalist exploitation was only possible by means of something of a definitional trick. Bonded labor cannot be part of capitalism, it was alleged, because workers' choice is central to the nature of capitalist exploitation. Surprisingly, Remikandran's own position has received scarcely any critical comment. In retrospect, it seems that if there was any juggling with definitions, it was his own curious assertion on the very first page of his book, that whereas hired, work, hired labor was compatible with unfreedom, wage labor was not. The distinction stated there is obvious, obviously arbitrary. For most of us, hired labor and wage labor are interchangeable terms, and there is certainly no lexicon of social science vocabulary that assigns these particular distinctions to them. What, what Ramakandran was obviously keen to do was preserve a model of wage labor that would make the institution unintelligible outside its conventional description in the language of voluntarism. That this language came to us suffused with the premises and dichotomies of classical individualism, suffused in other words with ideology in the strongest sense, was ostensibly beyond Remikandran's interest in the issue. Since I would define ideology as a system of beliefs, representations that naturalize social relations, particularly those of domination, the unreflexive stance vis-a-vis -vis the individualist construction of wage labor as free labor seemed to do little to confront the illusion of naturalness wrapped up with this notion. Accepting the individualist construction of wage labor as a free bargain, Remikandran then faced the problem of the value to assign to this freedom. Thus, wage labor and unfreedom characterizes the freedom of the free worker, both as formal and as positive. Not much is said about either of these notions or the contradiction implicit in using both characterizations. Free wage labor is often referred to as free wage labor, implying adherence to the first description. But Ramakandran also speaks of the basic self-dignity and freedom from servitude that the freedom of, to choose employers implies. At any rate, one interesting consequence of this line of reasoning is that bondage precludes capitalism since capitalism is based on wage labor and wage labor excludes bondage. For Ramakandran, the polarity is one between wage labor and unfreedom because wage labor is by definition free and free is construed here as substantially the opposite of unfree. Tom Brass replaces this with the general polarity between free and unfree labor because unlike Ramakandran, he seems to be unsure whether wage laborers can be unfree. There is only one passage in his book where he uses the expression unfree wage labor against many more where, we, where wage labor is routinely described as free wage labor and numerous others where he speaks of unfree labor tout court. Indeed, the index, the index to towards a comparative political economy of unfree labor contains no item for wage labor. Measured against the realms of confident polemic on the issues of free and unfree labor, 
The least this suggests is a lack of clarity about where wage labor itself fits into a conceptual schema built around the mesmerizing contrast between free and unfree labor. Brass constructs a rigorously Manichian, Manichian, Manichian universe where workers are either free or unfree, and the scholars who write about them either realize that or function as apologists of bonded labor. He argues that debt-bound labor is unfree, i.e. not free labor dominated through debt, that employers use debt and bondage to decommodify labor, reincorporate labor into the means of production, and finally, that this tendency of the forcible exclusion of workers from the labor market increases as individual employers restructure the composition of the workforce to stave off growing class consciousness, since unfree workers are unlikely to organize. Brass has a peculiar notion of proletarianization. He defines it not in terms of the dispossession of labor, but evidently as the formation of an organized working class. This enables him to speak of the factors which impede the formation of organized groups of workers as deproletarianization. Bonded laborers may or may not be wage laborers. Brass leaves this unclear, but they are not a proletariat in the idealized Lucician sense used by Brass. Agrarian capitalists use bondage to deprive workers of an incipient proletarian subjectivity. The upshot of their stark dualities is that Brass and Remacandran both subscribe to a liberal individualist notion of wage labor as essentially free labor, labor based on the consent of the individual worker and the free bargain that embodies that consent. This is in sharp contrast to Marx, whose references to free labor have a profoundly delegitimating intent. There are two aspects to Marx's handling of free labor. In Marx, free labor is both defined historically and contested ideologically. These are different levels of abstraction. And while both are significant, my interest in this paper is in the second. I want to argue that his contestation of free labor makes Marx the first significant thinker to have adumbrated the critique of, cont of contract, which emerged in the critical legal traditions of the 20th century, starting with the legal realists. To abstract the references to free labor from the framework of this critique is to run the risk of imparting a naturalness to the notion of freedom, which it does not possess. Not only did it take the modern world a long time to define a model of employment based on contract, but when such a model did emerge, finally in the 19th century, wage labor was shrouded in a legal mysticism that remains with us to this day. The famous passage in Capital Volume 1, which describes the sphere of circulation as a very Eden of the innate rights of man, is a succinct and sardonic statement of the 19th century liberal individualist ideology of contract. Freedom, equality, and property are symbolic of the abstractions of classical individualism, core individualist concepts, while the references to natural rights, free will, and Bentham resonate with ideological imagery. The implication is that freedom is understood strictly in terms of the ideology of contract and the abstractions of individualism. Later in volume one, Marx characterizes the employment contract as a legal fiction, which with the mobility of labor sustains the appearance of independence. Later still, the free contract between capitalists and workers is described as an illusion. The perspective framing these sorti these sorties or stories against individualism is the conception of the individual free worker from the standpoint of capital as such that is of the total social capital thus in reality the worker belongs to capital before he has sold himself to the capitalist his economic bondage is at once mediated through and concealed by the periodic renewal of the act by which he sells himself, his change of masters and the oscillations in the market price of his labor. Again, the individual workers' enslavement to capital is only concealed by the variety of individual capitalists to whom she sells herself. Finally, the relation of exchange between capitalist and worker becomes a mere semblance 
belonging only to the process of circulation. It becomes a mere form, which is alien to the content of the transaction itself, and merely mystifies it. All of this is summed up in a fascinating passage of the famous appendix, where free contract is described as a formality, though one essential to capitalism, one of the essential mediating forms of capitalist relations of production, which is nonetheless a mystification of the essential nature of wage labor, an illusion or deceptive appearance. In other words, the essential nature of wage labor cannot lie in any of the ideological representations which legitimate the oppression of workers. To counterpose free labor to unfree labor the way brass does is to ignore contract law's role in making actual domination appear free, natural, and rational. As Feynman and Gable argue, the rise of capitalism generated a dramatic and dislocating social upheaval. How could people have been persuaded or forced to accept such massive disruptions to their lives? One vehicle of persuasion was the law of contracts, which generated a new ideological imagery that sought to give legitimacy to the new order. Contract law was one of, of many such forms of imagery in law, politics, religion, and other representations of social experience that concealed and denied the oppressive and alienating aspects of the new social and economic relations. Contract law denied the nature of the system by creating an, Im an imagery that made the oppression and alienation appear to be the consequences of what the people themselves desired. Marx's conception of the wage contract can thus be summed up in the words used by Frederick Kessler to describe standardized contracts or contracts of adhesion in modern capitalism. The worker's contractual intention is but a subjection more or less voluntary to terms dictated by the stronger party. That is, nothing in the nature of free labor prevented employers from imposing the harshest possible terms on their employees, including restrictions on their mobility. If this seems paradoxical, that is only so because contract entails the general irony of coercion imposed in the name of freedom. Freedom of contract enables capitalists to legislate by contract and to legislate in a substantially authoritarian manner without using the appearance of authoritarian forms. Brass construes unfree labor in terms of mechanisms of control, which tie labor down. The key mechanism is debt. The explanation lacks nuance, perhaps deliberately, and detachment, debt, and bondage become interchangeable expressions of an undifferentiated coercion, unfreedom. Marx himself defined free labor primarily in terms of the dispossession of labor, and then of course its ability to make valid contracts. Since subordination, obedience, subjection to the employer is the essence of wage labor, it would have made no sense to allow the control of labor and the labor process and or the employment relation to cancel freedom all the way through. Discussing the feudal remnant in the governance of American labor in the late 19th century, the remarkable fact that the law of master and servant was at the foundation of capitalist development and industrialism, Karen Oren writes, whatever the public rights and private aspirations of the worker, he or she was in reality a free person against everyone except his or her employer. That does not mean there were no rights the servant could assert against the master, but they were severely restricted by the processes and content of the law and by the practicalities that stemmed from the master's own absolute right to terminate the employment at any time. In the majority of instances discussed by Brass, contract is oh no, I lost my spot. Contract is always the background against which coercion operates. But this is but this is contract imbued with a profound sense of inequality. The hierarchy of master and servant, a medieval remnant, even if the relations of production are certainly capitalist. To repeat in both Brass and Ramachandran, the critique of unfree labor is secured at a price, namely endorsing the liberal mystification of a free bargain. Against Marx's conception of the labor market as an instrument of coercion and the realist undermining of the premises of liberal legalism, on the other hand, their problematics diverge. 
The issue for Brass is whether labor that he construes as unfree is compatible with capital capitalism, the issue underlying the formalist orthodoxy on wage labor is a different and more substantial one, though namely whether unfree labor can ever be construed as wage labor, and here Brass is on the whole curiously silent, although he does at one point allow for the characterization of unfree workers as unfree wage labor. The condescension with which Remikandran dismissed Mundell would be less tenable today. In the diary of his travels in South India, Francis Buchanan refers repeatedly to hired servants who were held in bondage by their masters, unaffected by the formalisms that would later swamp the world of labor. He saw no obvious incongruity in juxtaposing what appear to us to be sharply conflicting images. To quote one of several, uh, to quote one of several possible passages from the travel diaries he wrote about Southern Kanara, the cultivation is chiefly carried on by Kulialu, or hired servants. At the end of the year, the hired servant may change his service if he be free from debt, but that is seldom the case. When he gets deeply involved, his master may sell his sister's children to discharge the amount, and his services may be transferred to any other man who chooses to take him and pay his debts to his master. In fact, he differs little from a slave. The bonding of migrant workers discussed by Bremen in Footloose Labor described a form of wage labor in which employers use, use force and oppression as tools with which to increase their hold on the workers. Here again, there is no abstract antithesis between bondage and the hiring of labor, even if the context is vastly different with a massive erosion in the legitimacy of upper caste dominance and workers less willing to accept domination. That workers did fight back even in much earlier periods is shown by the repeated litigation brought by Indian labor laborers before the general Indian court of colonial Mexico for most of the 17th and 18th centuries. Bora described the form of exploitation involved, so-called debt peonage, as the recruitment of wage labor bound by debt, describing the workers themselves as coerced but not enslaved. Again, Martin Murray shows that the European rubber plantations of northern and eastern Co Cochinchina used a contract system that legally bound wage laborers to the point of production for periods that almost always exceeded the initial three-year agreement. Finally, in a review of Byers' book on agrarian capitalism. Charles Post argues that capital is often compelled um, to rely on legally bonded wage workers. These workers are bound to a single employer or branch of production by laws restricting their ability to move geographically and enter short-term labor contracts. Stating all this in a more general form, employers have repeatedly subjected free workers to repressive forms of control. The massive deployment of Polish seasonal laborers on the East Elbian states during the First World War and under Nazism, the forced recruitment of wage laborers in French and British Africa, and the position of 19th century English wage earners who faced criminal sanctions for breach of contract, all exemplify situations where the boundary between compulsion and free will was neither distinct nor of any great interest to the authority, authorities and employers. Likewise, if attachment is basically a means of control over labor, there is no reason why debt servitude cannot be a means of controlling wage laborers. The advanced payment of wages is manipulated to intensify the domination of labor. This at least partly deals with the orthodoxy that restrictions on freedom undermine the nature of wage labor. Regarding the related issue of whether capital can exploit workers who are truly unfree, who represent bondage in Kant's sense, the major problem with Brass's way of handling this thesis, apart from his definition of unfree labor, is that the need of individual and social capital are conflated throughout his argument. Brass conceives capitalism entirely from the standpoint of individual capital, ignoring the fact that the logic that regulates capitalist economy is necessarily that of the total social capital. Thus, the real issue of theory here is whether we can sensibly visualize the accumulation of capital being founded on unfree labor, in the strict sense just noted, at the level of the expansion of the total social capital.
And the obvious response is no, since the mobility of labor is essential to the mechanism of capital at this level. That individual capitals are indifferent to the nature of the labor force and have no special concern for the rights of workers was argued at length in my paper in Capital and Class in 1977. 5.3, forms of exploitation based on wage labor. Expanding on the argument developed in that paper, capitalist accumulation may involve any of the following methods. One, more or less coerced, more or less free forms of wage labor. Two, unfree labor in the strict sense. Three, the integration of peasant family labor into the capitalist production process. There is scarcely any doubt that Marx came around to seeing the southern plantations, based on slavery, as capitalist enterprises. Thus, the overworking of slaves in the southern states of the American Union was, he tells us in Volume 1, a question of the production of surplus value itself. In the Grundrisse, he refers to the fact that we now not only call the plantation owners in America capitalists, but that they are capitalists and implies that these anomalous forms of capitalist enterprise could exist because capitalism as a whole was based on free labor. My interpretation of this is the American slave owners are capitalists because they are part of the total social capital. In theories of surplus value, he writes that the business in which slaves are used is conducted by capitalists. Though this is qualified by saying that here the capitalist mode of production exists only in a formal sense. Finally, in volume three of Capital, he writes, where the capitalist conception prevails, as on the American plantations, this entire surplus value is conceived as profit. And in volume two, slaves are described as fixed capital. It is worth noting that among later Marxists, Henrik Grossman saw no incongruity in accepting Sombart's description of the 17th century. Plantations as the first exemplars of truly large scale capitalist organization. Indeed, Grossman argued that in the first hundred years following the discovery of America, the whole character of Spanish and Portuguese colonization was already capitalist in nature, characterized as it was by a drive for surplus value, even if the plantations were run on the basis of slave labor. At the level of individual capitals, it is accumulation or the drive for surplus value that defines capitalism, not the presence or absence of free labor. Yet a majority of Marxists are probably still reluctant to abandon the comforting idea that slavery precludes capitalism because capitalism is founded on free labor. Um, add three, capitalist integration of the peasantry is best illustrated by the use of the advanced system in 19th century Indian agriculture. Advances were especially widespread in the production of indigo, cotton, and sugarcane. Thus, the speculative capitalism of the agency houses that controlled the Bengal indigo trade in the early 19th century was based on a system of advances through which planters sought to bind the peasantry to the factory. The report of the Indigo Commission noted that the contract for the growth and production of the plant, so far from being voluntary, is forced upon the riot, who is compelled by more or less pressure to accept advances. About the squaring of accounts that began in October, one respondent told the commission, there are some individuals who could clear themselves if we would let them, but we would not clear them on principle in as much as it would be tantamount to closing the factory. Indeed, Chowdhury reports that Macaulay, Macaulay looked upon the contract between the planter and the peasant as of the same kind as one between the capitalist and a worker. In short, Historically, capital accumulation has been characterized by considerable flexibility in the structuring of production and in the forms of labor and organizations of labor used in producing surplus value. The liberal conception of capitalism, which sees the sole basis of accumulation in the individual wage earner, conceived as a free laborer, obliterates a great deal of capitalist history, erasing the contribution of both enslaved and collective family units of labor power. To take this further, it would surely represent an advance in Marxist theory to think of capitalism working through multiplicity of forms of exploitation based on wage labor.
In other words, instead of seeing wage labor as one form of exploitation among many, alongside sharecropping, labor tenancy, and various kinds of bonded labor, these specific individuals form or individual forms of exploitation may just be ways in which paid labor is recruited, exploited, and controlled by employers. The argument is not that all sharecroppers, labor tenants, and bonded laborers are wage workers, but that these forms may reflect the subsumption of labor into capital in ways where the sale of labor power for wages is mediated and possibly disguised in more complex arrangements. The prototype of this kind of analysis is Wazinski's conception of the Byzantine sharecropper as a wage laborer. Analyzing Egyptian agricultural leases of the 6th and 7th centuries, Wazinski argued the oh, son of a bitch. This is another alphabet that I can't read. Of the 6th, 7th, 6th to 7th centuries is basically no longer a tenant. He has become a hired worker or wage laborer whom the landlord can dismiss at any time. To form a proper assessment of these contracts, we should, instead of seeing the share accruing to the landlord in the division of the crop as rent, view the portion received by the, I don't know, sharecropper, I guess is what it, I, I'm gonna assume that it's supposed to mean sharecropper. I don't, Yeah, I'll say sharecropper, but again, it's an alphabet that I don't know, so, as a wage. <laughs> in Bengal in the 1930s, the various landholders' associations consistently took the stand that their bargadars, sharecroppers, were mere laborers, that is, workers paid in kind, arguing that landowners preferred sharecropping due to its greater intensity of labor. In the U.S., most southern states drew a legal distinction between croppers and tenants. Because the landlord supplied all necessary means of production, the sharecropper was a wage worker whose form of wages was a share of the crop. Angelo characterizes southern sharecropping, or at least the legal con uh, construction of it, as a disguised wage work contract. Francesco Maria Gianni described the Tuscan sharecroppers of the late 18th century as workers recruited by their respective landowners to hire out their labor not by the day or for any precise and definite daily wages, but for at least a year and for half the crop produced by them. Jones showed how, even as early as the late 14th and 15th centuries, oh sorry, yet PJ Jones <laughs> showed how, even as early as the late 14th and 15th centuries, when Ms. Mizadria expanded on the, on the estates in Tuscany and embodied a form of wage type tenancy with leaseholders akin to labor contracts. With renewed commercialization in the late 19th century and the introduction of the new industrial crops, the Mizadri were subjected to further waves of proletarianization as farm sizes were drastically cut, work controls tightened, and eviction formally conceded to employers as their sole means of restoring discipline. Snowden refers to the emergence in sizable numbers from the end of the century of a variety of new subcategories of semi-proletarianized mesodry. Comporial, comporiali, legali, vigniali, and, and mesali, definitely pronounced those all terribly. The new sharecroppers did not live on their plots. Instead, they commuted to the land from neighboring villages or from laborers' barracks. Labor tenancy is susceptible to a similar analysis. Lenin described this form of exploitation as the capitalist system of providing the estate with agricultural workers by allotting patches of land to them and characterized the allotment itself as wages in kind. He referred to labor being hired on a labor service and bonded basis. Moreover, the latter form of labor always presupposes the personal dependence of the one hired upon the one who hires him. It always presupposes the greater or lesser retention of other than economic pressure. The less developed forms of agrarian capitalism made extensive use of labor tenancy. In South Africa, black families without the, re without the resources to work the land themselves entered labor tenancy agreements. Labor tenants were thus worse off. 
less independent than sharecroppers. Yet labor tenancies staved off total dispossession. The form of payment was at least as strongly influenced by tenants' aspirations to regain access to land and accumulate cattle as by the shortage of cash among landowners. In fact, obtaining pastures was far and away the most important reason for surrender to tenancy by homestead heads. Typically, the negotiation of labor tenant contracts centered around cattle and children. With the landlords grudgingly trading off grazing for the first in exchange for sufficient labor from the second. If employers preferred wages in kind, so clearly did tenant households for whom the cash proceeds of their labor contracts were of little or no economic significance. But while farmers lobbied aggressively um, to have labor tenants placed under the jurisdiction of the Master and Servant Acts, oh, but white farmers lobbied aggressively to have labor tenants placed under the jurisdiction of the Master and Servant Acts. The general point to emerge from these struggles is that as employers are driven to increase their control over these forms of labor, sharecroppers included, the contracts and means of compulsion used by them are progressively modified to diminish the rights of workers and their families and proletarianize them further. Similarly, Buchanan's reference to hired servants who were held in bondage by their masters forms the prototype for the analysis of bonded labor as a further distinction of form within wage labor. The key mechanism here is debt, but the failure to disentangle industrial profit in Marx's sense from its fetishistic representation in the consciousness of employers generates endless confusion, even in the work of Marxists like Brass. Interest is a relationship between two capitalists, not between capitalist and worker. That employers choose to treat wage advances, part of their variable, i.e. productive, capital, as loans has nothing to do with the real nature of the relationships, which are those between wage laborers and the functioning capitalist. The contrast between these levels, or forms, of reality is recurrent in Marx. Thus, interest is just another name for surplus value. Marx says of the advances made by usurers, money capitalists, in India. Profit is called rent, just as it is called interest, when, for example, as in India, the worker, although nominally independent, works with advances he receives from the capitalist and has to hand over all the surplus produce to the capitalist. Where profit is acquired in the form of interest, is called interest, the capitalist appears as a mere usurer. When this form of capitalism operates to control the labor of peasant producers, who are both free and formally independent, we have here the whole of capitalist production without its advantages, namely the development of the social forms of labor and the productivity of labor that these generate. In each of these passages, Marx implies a distinction between the actual nature of production, which is capitalist, and the forms in which those relations of production and exploitation are portrayed or represented in the consciousness of its agents. To take these forms of representation at face value, for example, to divide the cash advances made by employers to their workers into a wage component and a loan component, as Brass does, is to move within the fetishized appearances that dominate the everyday. Oh, the everyday notions of the actual agents of production. Thus, wage advances are characterized as loans, employers described as creditors, and workers transformed into debtors. The advances themselves are described both as wages for future employment and as a loan for work yet to be done in the same paragraph. What this does is to conflate a component of productive capital, namely wages, with a form of interest-bearing capital. It also fails to see that when employers advance wages, they actually buy labor instead of simply paying for it later. Suppose that the use of cash kind advances represents not the actual buying of labor power, which is what it is, but simply the accumulation of claims to unrealized labor. There is still an issue about the nature of those claims, conceived of, of those claims, 
Conceived as interest-bearing capital, the claims to future labor would be fictitious capital in the sense that the creditor cannot recall his capital from the debtor, but at best can only sell the claim, his title of ownership. The capital itself has been consumed, spent by the worker. It no longer exists. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my spot. Um, in other words, conceived as debt, <clears throat> In the strict sense, the capital laid out in advances to the worker would be fictitious in exactly the sense in which the national debt represents fictitious capital. What the creditor possesses is simply a promissory note, a bond, equivalent, equivalent to the state's promissory notes when creditors buy government bonds. But the advances are not securities at all. There's no proper market for the circulation of such paper assets, and the analogy is as absurd as that between the usurer's interest and the modern interest rate decreed by Marx. Debt, that is the depiction of wages as loans, is simply a device to control labor in conditions where the competition for labor is likely to drive up the bargaining power and wage of workers. It is a legal or pseudo-legal fiction used by employers to maneuver workers into a system of forced labor, which is still wage labor, or contain their mobility and manipulate effort standards. Some employers clearly believed in the sanctity, legality of this fiction. Others were and have been under no illusion. 5.4. Free Contract in Sartre's Critique Vulgar Marxists have worked with a rigid dichotomy between free and unfree labor, suggesting that lack of coercion is a defining feature of wage labor. This bright line approach camouflages the fact that all wage labor is subject to compulsion, both in the general and widely accepted sense that workers are compelled to sell their labor power and subject at this level to general market or economic coercion and more directly, insofar as the exchange involved in wage labor is one of obedience for wages, and employers have to find ways to enforce contracts. Given that all wage labor is subject to constraint in this double sense, it follows that the freedom of free labor is best construed in a minimalist sense to mean primarily the legal capacity, autonomy required to enter a labor agreement. Construed in this way, Marx's references to successive Tudor governments driving the property list into free labor in a process he calls the forced labor of free workers seem much less paradoxical than they might otherwise, as does Sartre's parallel ref reference to free forced labor, as typical of the repressive liberal capitalism of the early 19th century. In particular, Sartre's expression refers to the methods used by English employers to break the recalcitrance of skilled workers and produce a subjugated labor force. If labor subjected to repressive practices within factories was nonetheless free, this is because freedom in this context refers minimalistically to the mystified, mystifying moment of the wage contract and the freedom of contract rhetoric of 19th century liberal individualism. Sartre's references to free labor and the critique work in terms of an implicit contrast between the real freedom of the worker, identified as the worker's human reality and the abstract or mystified freedom of the wage contract. Contract mystifies freedom, both because the form of a free contract disguises the dictatorial power of the employer and makes the worker's domination appear free, natural, and rational and because the worker's freedom is in fact complicit in its own crushing. The wage contract belongs to the practico inert field of exploitation, whereas employment and labor, the search for work and work itself, presuppose the human freedom of the worker or free individual praxis insofar as these are forms of human activity. Thus, freedom is present in two guises. As the mystification of free labor, labor the inert idea of liberal ideology and as the real freedom of the practical organism, which is praxis itself, conceived not as an abstract force traversing the heterogeneous moments of dialectical intelligibility, 
but as the free actions of individuals, the free activity which in its freedom will take upon itself everything which crushes it, which is masked by collective representations and the coerciveness of industrial routine, and without which alienation, that is, the impotence of freedom or the impossibility inside freedom, would cease to have any meaning since there would be nothing to be alienated. Thus, to say that the worker freely sells his labor power is not tantamount to the claim that the worker's action is unconstrained or uncoerced, but rather that the sale of labor power, like work itself and all human activity, requires the sovereign freedom of a practical agent. As Sartre says, it is true that he has no other way out. The choice is an impossible one. He is not the ghost of a chance of finding better paid work, and in any case, he never even asks himself the question, what is the point of it all? He goes and sells himself at the factory every morning by a sort of somber, resigned hexis, which scarcely resembles a praxis. And yet, in fact, it is a praxis. Habit is directed and organized. The end is posited, the means chosen. In other words, the ineluctable destiny which is crushing him passes right through him. One of the great strengths of the critique of dialectical reason is its clarification of this issue. A Marxism untouched by the insights of the critique conflates the real freedom of the worker as a practical agent. The freedom that wage laborers share with all workers and all kinds of workers throughout history, with the mystified freedom projected in the rhetoric of liberal legalism and the common law doctrine of the private right of free contract. More importantly, Sartre recovers the legal realist insight that constraint does not eliminate freedom, except by liquidating the oppressed. Coercion is not an overpowering of the will. A victim of duress does, does normally know what he is doing, does choose to submit, and does intend to do so. Conversely, the fact that he, the victim, exercised a choice does not indicate lack of compulsion. Even a slave makes a choice. The compulsion which drives him to work operates through his own willpower. Though he exercises willpower and makes a choice, still, since he is making it under threat, his servitude is called involuntary. It follows that the moment of the free contract between employers and wage earners is, in Sartre's words, both the most shameless mystification and a reality. And it is a reality not because freedom of contract implies or entails that labor recruited by contract is free in the sense of being uncoerced, but because everything is sustained by individual praxis. 5.5, summary. An uncritical deployment of the free, unfree labor antithesis valorizes one of the most powerful fictions of possessive individualism, namely the notion that the freedoms of circulation inherent in contract are an expression of individual freedom, and that free laborers have some measure of control over their working lives because they can choose who to work for. This contrasts sharply with Marx's conception of the wage contract as a legal fiction that both mediated and masked the domination of labor by capital. Brass deploys a discourse of freedom and unfreedom, as if these terms had an obvious meaning. He identifies free labor with the free circulation of labor, and this is clearly also how Marx understood the expression. The crucial difference, however, is that that is all free labor meant for Marx. He did not view the worker as a free agent, whereas for Brass, free labor resonates with its opposition to unfree labor, evoking subliminal images of freedom from bondage, oppression, and coercion as if free labor was exempt from violence, much less from subtler forms of bondage and coercion. In short, the fiction of the free labor contract is renaturalized in an uncritical antinomy of free and unfree labor. Secondly, I have argued that while the organization of labor under capital accumulation implicates forms of exploitation beyond the presumptively normative free labor contract, notably slavery and the centralized field labor of slaves, the wage contract itself can be organized in different ways under different labor systems, for example, as sharecropping, labor tenancy, or various forms of bondage, once we extend the notion of wages to include payments in land, 
housing, etc. Family free labor is a construct of liberal ideology, the lived experience of oppression under capitalism mystified as an outcome of ordinary principles of freedom of contract, and the only real freedom workers possess under capitalism or any system of domination is their power of resistance. That is the capacity they have as individuals to act on the world, both individually and through the common action of groups.